everybody. I'm Stesha Brandon, the Program Manager at Seattle City of Literature. Thank you so much for joining us. As we begin tonight, I'd like to acknowledge that we are on Indigenous land. Here in Seattle, we're on the traditional unceded territories of the Coast Salish people, specifically the Duwamish people. We honor their elders past and present and thank them for their stewardship of this land. Welcome to this evening's program with Iona Winter and Sasha LaPointe, moderated by Rena Priest, presented by Seattle City of Literature and Dunedin UNESCO City of Literature, and supported by Seattle's Office of Arts and Culture, the Amazon Literary Partnership, and Seattle University. When Seattle was designated a UNESCO City of Literature back in 2017, we joined a global network of creative cities. There are currently 39 cities of literature around the world, and we're delighted to partner tonight with Dunedin, New Zealand to bring you this program. Both Dunedin and Seattle have amazing indigenous writers and we're excited to highlight their work. We'll, we'll hear poems from Iona and Sasha, and then they will also appear in conversation moderated with Rena Priest. Iona Winter, Waitaha Katimamoi Kai Tahu, lives in Dunedin, New Zealand. Her hybrid work is widely published in literary journals internationally. Iona creates work to be performed, relishing cross-modality collaboration, and holds a master's of creative writing. She's authored three collections, Gaps in the Light from 2021, Tuho Kaika, and Then the Wind Came. Skilled at giving voice to difficult topics, she often draws on her deep connection to land, place, and huenua. Rena Priest, Sewell Tunat, is a poet and an enrolled member of the Clactamish Lummi Nation. She's been appointed to serve as the Washington State Poet Laureate for the term of April 2021 to 2023. She is a Vaden Foundation Fellow and a recipient of an Allied Arts Foundation Professional Poets Award. Her debut collection, Patriarchy Blues, was published by Moonpath Press and received an American Book Award. She's a National Geographic Explorer and a Jack Straw writer, and she holds an MFA from Sarah Lawrence College. But first, we're going to hear from Sasha. Sasha Takshablu Lapointe is a Coast Salish author from the Nooksack and Upper Skagit Indian tribes. She received a Dumble MFA in Creative Nonfiction and Poetry from the Institute of American Indian Arts. She is the author of Red Paint, a memoir which is forthcoming in 2022, and she lives in Tacoma, Washington. Please help me welcome Iona Winter, Rena Priest, and first, Sasha Lapointe. Hi, Sasha. Thank you um, for that uh, beautiful introduction and for having me here tonight. Um, this is wonderful. Um, Taksha Blue, Seed Sta. I'm Sasha Lapointe. I'm happy to be here. And I'm going to read um, just three poems from. Um, a collection, a little zine that I made um, called Rose Quartz, uh, which is has been picked up for publication with um, Milkweed. So it'll be coming out in 2023. Um, so again, thank you. And I will just start with some poems. <clears throat> the canoe my grandmother gave me when my grandmother hit record, the record button on the cassette pl player, it startled my great aunt. What is it? What does it do? It's going to capture the language, my grandmother said, to keep it. My great aunt thought about this for a long while. When she was a child, my great aunt traveled by river, by inland waters to relatives, to bring them fish, to carry the news. She looked down at the cassette recorder and nodded. Ah, she said, this is just a different kind of canoe. The last time we would eat together, we sat by a picture window overlooking the channel. She pushed fried oysters around her plate, Chardonnay pooling on white linen. At six, I licked frosting bone white from China. My mother, embarrassed, reached for the plate. My grandmother slapped her hand away just let her enjoy it. And we rotated high above the city, the space needle spinning clouds into sugar. Now she looks over oysters, out past the docks. Remember when all of this was underwater? She points a greasy fork to the hill beyond the bridge. They kept the dead up there before they came and built a church. 
I see canoes high above a white cha chapel in branches of trees no longer there. Speeding along asphalt, along LaConnor Whitney Road, the back seat sticky with whiskey, the smell of cow shit of cut grass, I look out at the snaking body of water contained, curling and flexing to keep up. It was all underwater, she'd say, until they came and built dikes and farmhouses, planted fields just for tulips, stretching lakes of daffodils. With my head against glass, bottle of whiskey in my lap, I squint until the channel breaks free, until the roads are water again. When I woke to find him there, breathing heavy, blonde, 210 pounds of quarterback of animated Coors Light above me, I learned to sever head from heart, dunked my head beneath water that was no longer there, to drown again and again, to breathe in river silt and mud, count silver scales of fish and all the white pebbles rushing past. We learned to say, I just let it happen. We learned to use words in forgotten languages. I learned to hold my breath beneath the currents, unaware of the boat on the riverbank waiting there. And this next one is called um, Redwoods. I told myself I'd never write a poem about the Redwoods because it's been done, because I've made this trip twice now with people I have loved, and what's left to say about old wood. I told you I'd be okay as I left you curbside in San Francisco, drove away to a sad 90s playlist, not crying along to the music, but in my best riot girl kind of way. At least I had to make a fire after a five hour drive, had to watch my sad vegan hot dogs as they blistered into something unnatural in the flames. I am tired of writing about old things, like grandmothers and languages that are dying and these trees big and mythic, too old to give a shit about what is happening in the cities, bodies gunned down in the streets, pandemics, police brutality, and this old growth just towering like we told you so, like you didn't see this was coming. Further north, and further from you, I swim in rivers and lakes. Outside of Arcata, I already miss California. Hot sand and sex and your face when it is still sleeping. Through Newport, through Brookings, I am drumming my fingers on the steering wheel, singing along with Janet and Bikini Kill. If I was your girl, all the things I'd do to you. Pull off in a town that smells of cow shit and seagrass, ignore the Trump signs, forget that I'm not allowed to pump my own gas. Make you call out my name and ask who it belongs to. You ask me to move in with you, and that's big, like Haystack Rock, like drive-in movie theaters, their parking lots all painted and abandoned. And I am considering this because I miss San Diego, miss your blonde hair, warm pavement, and bomb pops melting over my fingers, blue and sticky like when I was a kid. How is it I have never dated someone who is also Coast Salish, or at least indigenous? Instead, it's Disney's Pocahontas, her animated dad with his hands up, these white men are dangerous, and I come running. Maybe it's time I slept with someone who understands me traditionally, who shares my spirit dreams, but you have your van and that California tan and you have kickflips and ollies and I am a sucker for you when you come home from surfing, limping because of a stingray. Today, I am in Astoria and the trees are different here. The sea is cold and gray like it is supposed to be, and they say where you're from never leaves your body. This land is in my blood, and it likes to remind me. You think I forgot? Motherfucker, you redwoods are a rude awakening. I pass the places that mark me Indian, the signs that point me to the reservation, Dead Man's Cove and the Pioneer Museum, 
museum, trailer homes like bones and seals you can feed like dogs. You want me to move in with you and I am looking at the succulents on the dash plucked from your yard and jammed into a makeshift planter that once housed LaCroix cans, wilted and thirsty for sun, a sweet memento, but I hate how we've displaced them. I am in love with a white boy from California, an artist, a skateboarder, a beautiful colonizer who brings me coffee every morning, who grew up sun swimming, who knows how to hold me when I black out during intimacy because I have forgotten for a moment that I am safe. And if I am to relocate, I will remember to stop at these trees, will hit the steering wheel hard and singing because I will never be done writing about old things. Um, and I will just read one more. And this one is called, Teach Me to Say I Love You. Teach me to say I love you in your language. I have forgotten how to speak like something caught in my throat, a fishbone broken, splintering me into something quiet. Muted and star-like, lost in a sky, the word for sky is Shepulgwetz. Teach me to say, just stay, stay put, stay here, because I have forgotten how to be inside my own body, whatever my body has become beneath your tongue, conquered and ugly, malformed and mispronounced. Teach me a word better than survivor, like watching my grandmother pour black coffee in the kitchen and the stacks of legal pads filled up with her words and I tried to listen. The word for language is wigwatted. Teach me to say I love you because every time I walk into a restaurant to meet a date, I hesitate. I remember the trees along Portland Avenue in their red bows, like gift packages on Christmas morning. This is to honor assault survivors. How my mother tied each one, hugging their bark in ribbon. And I think of this as he pulls the chair out, takes my jacket and pours the wine red into the glass and asks if I am hungry. Red is what I remember when I think of how he will have to take me home and learn how to unwrap me. Teach me to say I love you because what good is a ribbon if it cannot hold us together where we have been broken. Teach me to speak in a language older than words, specifically the words of white men whose tongues touch everything. Quiet yourself and listen. Oh, oh, shabitsi chud. Oh, oh, shabitsi chud. Like a sigh I would make as a child comfortable and safe than the thud of my heart as it beats in my chest, its thrum as it drums inside my rib cage. Thank you. Thank you, that was amazing, beautiful. I can't wait to talk to you about these poems. <laughs> And next we have um, Iona Winter, who's gonna do a reading for us. Iona? I'm excited to hear your work today. Kia ora. Uh, <clears throat> e ka iwi, e ka karakataka, te iti me te rahi, te nā koutou, te nā tātou, te nā koutou katoa. I'm going to read a couple of pieces um, from my, my latest book, um, Gaps in the Light. Um, the first one is called More Ancient Than Any of Us. Birds swoop over the whenua. Reminders of you alight upon puku and manawa, and nighttime channels thoughts unspoken in daylight. Lit fires smolder upon open ground more ancient than any of us. Desire grew in the air between us. 
braided awa beneath Rako limbs came crashing earthward into landscapes of enlivened senses. The gifts inside their ringed stumps spoke of ages and shadow tones and graced our faces with crossed lattices. Streams of consciousness like gaps in the light. Promises leaked from your eyes. They landed upon my soul, etching deep chasms of aroha before that mamai of yours disrupted the course and an undertow began to tear at the fabric of us, casting me out. My ringa ringa spread wide to expose secrets and you owned none of the lies that spilled over to lap at my feet where pūrere hua wings stroked my winnowed heart beating fast to the rhythm of our mother. Streams of consciousness like gaps in the light. Birdsong emerged between poor and ra to illuminate all the unnoticed seasons. But who can say whether we shifted and morphed with it or remained stagnant puzzles of links scattered from root to tip? our enacted patterns alive. Wind blows the tussocks in this unfamiliar place, yet the longing for you dissipates with each luminous marama cycle and recounts tidal surges in existence long before you left. And the kākahu always enfolds me, certain I will awake unbroken. <clears throat> this next one is called Mania Toto. Plain of blood and Scottish settlers, where winds rip through fields of foreign black faced sheep and mechanical arms stretch across acres. But their water comes from somewhere deep inside our mother already keening and fierce in her rock falls and floods. I feel my bare feet on her dusty earth amongst tussock, reunited with tupuna. But I don't hear the old songs, since only their footfalls over paths between Malka and Moana. Unadorned feet like mine know how to leave behind one season for another. They would not recognize you, Mania Toto, the whenua infinitely disturbed, like the place in me that is deeper than sorrow. Norera tina kota kato. Thank you. Wow. That was beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing your work, both of you. Um, I'm just really honored and excited to be asked to moderate this event and to participate with you today. Um, the, this work that we do and this work here um, is important and I'm, I'm happy that this platform exists for us today. So I'll share two poems, sh short, shortish poems, and then um, we'll start our conversation. So, I squire on the stalacha, oh he lips and quenas and attach a little kaias, the wild knots and a snatch of Um, I'll go ahead and start my reading. This first poem that I'll share is uh, it's a new poem and it's called Resonance, and it addresses the topic of Ait Hutchning, which is um, Lummi for good feelings, but it means more than that. It's when your heart and your mind are in resonance. That is uh, when you can be in resonance with things around you, with people and the things around you, and so that feels good. So it has an epigraph. All things were together, the mind came and arranged them. Anaxagoras. 
The flicker of a wave on the sea is a flame, not like a candle on a cake keeping tally of our days. Instead, the fire measures life together by the sweetness of resonance. How exalted by the dawn, we as one have sung our true song, become a single voice across the waves. The wax of a candle begins inside the humming darkness of a hive, but before that it begins as sunlight, calling forth blossoms, pollen, and bees. Bees who play matchmaker to trees, calling forth fruit to become new seeds. Where does love begin? It is a surprise, but obvious and easy, like breathing. It has been there all along, a flicker on the sea that swam up from the deep to touch air and light to shine like fire, leap from its element the way a tree becomes a boat so the earth can leap into the sea and sail toward adventure. Things are changed, things transform. This is the way the mind arranged it. The mind comes and arranges, the heart draws it all back toward union, washes away the illusion of separateness, gives new measures for happiness, a new way to celebrate the state of being of one heart and one mind. I touch me. Our song is a ferry that joins two shores. And this next poem is a little bit about my journey to learn the language. Um, it's called A Poem is a Naming Ceremony. What has grown out of what has gone away? The clear-cut patch has grown larger on the mountain. The rivers have grown murky with timber trash. And there's enough runoff manure to grow corn out there on the tide flat. I don't want to think about what has gone away. I want to meander and play and forget myself until I can grow a new me in place of all this grief. Learn the language to see the cottonwood as Quayalich each, the dancing tree, the killer whales as Quahomachin, our relatives under the sea, the whole glorious landscape filled with meaning to end my grieving. When I was young, I was invited to learn Quilnuchkin, the people's language, but I said no. I didn't understand. I thought I wanted to learn to be rich. I didn't know that the only way to possess all the wealth of the world is by naming it. Here is bird song. Here is the kiss of a lover. Here is the feel of cold water at the peak of summer. I have spent my life with words trying to name a hint of what I lost by not learning my language. Estetemsen, tutatisen, estetemsen. And uh, so now we'll, we'll begin with the discussion part of today's offering. So first, I think that um, I'd just like to ask about um, your most recent projects. Uh, you have Gaps in Light, Iona, and Sasha, your, um, your forthcoming book from Milkweed that you read from, it's called Rose Quartz. Yeah, yeah. So um, talk a little bit about what the process was um, of writing those and um, kind of what your hopes are for, for those as they come out into the world. Um, do, you, do you want me to start? Oh, sure. Okay. Whoever, just dive right in. <laughs> um, yeah, um, Rose Quartz and, and as well as the memoir Red Paint, um, I think were my, I mean, my process around writing has been, um, I mean, honestly, also, I just need to say, wow, what beautiful work from both of you. I'm still just kind of reeling. Like, how can I like snap back into it? That was so gorgeous. Thank you both for your beautiful, beautiful words. Um, definitely got emotional in there hearing the language and so beautiful. Thank you. Um, so uh, for me, like uh, my writing process, um, when I was still in my MFA program at IAIA, I had started this project of uh, writing a memoir about um, what it was like to grow up um, on the reservation, what it was like to survive um, 
you know, sexual assault and like, like it was a really hard book project that I took on and I finished it and I did it and ended up scrapping the whole manuscript. But throughout that process, I, I really unearthed a lot of hard things for myself, um, PTSD, um, the, like throughout that writing process, I, I sort of became unraveled in this way that was um, incredibly intense. And when I came to poetry, when I came to Rose Quartz, I sort of, um, and also with red paint, but I, I sort of went back to, I think it took getting to a place of just being undone by like unearthing these hard memories, like um, generational trauma, memories of like um, lived abuse and, and also like uh, the historical memory of abuse that I think lives in us as native people. Um, I took a big break from that and came to poetry and kind of remembered what it was like growing up with uh, my great grandmother and her language work. And that was really like a, a sort of grounding place for me to arrive at. And I think that when you're young and you grow up with like the language around you and stories around you, it's almost like I had not known how lucky I was to have that. And when I was in a state of just really, really hard, um, sort of triggered PTSD, I went back to those stories, the stories I heard from my grandmother growing up, just remembering the language. And I think when you are young, you think that something like that will be around forever, right? And when she passed and my family lost her, it was kind of like, oh, like how, how can I get back there? And so just revisiting her stories and listening to her many recordings um, speaking in our language, I started the process of writing these new books. And in that, I found healing. And I think growing up, learning that our stories are lessons, our songs are healing. Um, I really like I found that and, and, and poetry, like the Rose Quartz collection is all about that. And I started experimenting with um, learning my language as an adult, which is so hard. Like. Mm -hmm. um, which I'm sure like we could talk forever about so, hard. <laughs> um, so many conversations with my mom like can you teach me how to say this phrase you know and being a woman in my 30s it's like really hard to learn that stuff but the act of it was very healing and very um brought me back to like um growing up with it around me and I think trying to incorporate a little bit of the shoot seed words into my work is really challenging but also so powerful like there have been times where I've shown up at a reading and I look out and I see very fluent speakers and I see elders and I'm like oh I can't I can't do I, I can't say it. I'm going to say it wrong and I push myself and I do it and like um I think one of the first times I shared that poem teach me to say I love you was at an indigenous women's day reading and I looked out and I saw these elders and I was like oh I should change the poem I'm not going to read this and I just powered through and did it and afterwards um one of the elders came up to me and thanked me for speaking beautifully and like that that reminded me of like the work that I think my grandmother would have wanted me to do as her namesake and um I think that both with Rose Quartz and the memoir I'm trying to like do that and it's my hope that when they come out into the world that that is um a parent and that it's like a, as a grown-up trying to learn her traditional language like um just the power that 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 holds um I, I kind of rambled I'm sorry but that that's what my process around writing oh, that was perfect that was that was so uh thank you so much for all of that that was beautiful yeah and um also for how you um well I'll I'll Let's hear from Iona and then we'll carry on the conversation. I feel like I want to um, riff off what you said, really, Sasha, um, around that kind of, I don't know, I, I, I've been sitting with the, the, the notion of um, just being displaced and um, I think probably all my life have known that sense of intergenerational trauma and shame and indigeneity being hidden, particularly in our whanau and our family. Um, and I could tell you a million stories about that, but I think for me, um, 
my latest collection, Gaps in the Light, I'd been working on a bigger, uh, like a hybrid, um, do you know flash fiction over there? I don't know if you do, but it's really short form fiction. So I'd been working on a hybrid um, novella in flash fiction and it just wasn't coming together. And I was like, oh, I've had a whole lot of other stuff published. Why don't I do a collection? And then a whole lot of new stuff came. Um, and it all just, it's quite bittersweet to talk about it, but um, I, I finished it all. It was quite a drive in me. And I've always been someone who listens to my tupuna, my, my, my ancestors, and feel like they're quite close with me all the time. Um, the morning I finished the, the manuscript, um, I learned that afternoon that my son had taken his life. Um, and so getting that book out in the world was quite a big process because he um, was a really prolific musician here in Aotearoa, New Zealand. And um, he had a lot of unfinished, well, finished actually, but not out in the world um, albums. So as it turned out um, earlier this year, we toured his latest album and my book at the same time, which was kind of cool. Um, I was band mum for about a decade with him and his friends. Um, and so, bittersweet um but I do I've always talked about hard stuff um maybe because I worked as a therapist for some time and I've done a lot of my own work um and that notion of um intergenerational trauma but also trauma on 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 those of us who've experienced be that sexual um family violence um interpersonal violence I mean, violence is a big thing, isn't it? It's, it's everywhere. And so I talk about that stuff. I talk about suicide and um, I, with Flo, Ruben was the third mokopuna, so the third grandchild in our family in two years to take his life. So it's a really, it's a really big deal for me. And it's a, it's a very big problem here in New Zealand. Um, I'm not sure about where you are, but it's, it's massive for uh, indigenous populations. Um, yeah, I'm also rambling, <laughs> but I, do, I um, use, using the language is important to me. I grew up with a grandfather who was fluent. Um, however, it was my grandmother who was Indigenous, so <laughs> he knew the language and she hid it. So it's been a process of, um, I guess, not reclaiming it because there are a lot of things that I grew up with, but certainly there are words uh, in Māori that means so much more than English so they seem to come quite organically um, when I'm writing and I've never been attached to um, labels really so what I write is what I write it might be a story it might be a flash fiction it might be a poem it might be an essay um, yeah quite intuitive I think my process and I put that down to my connection with the land my connection with my ancestors um, and, and all it is. Yeah, so putting it together, I, I like this line in your work. Actually, there's two, there's a line from each of your poems that caught my ear. Iona, you say streams of consciousness like gaps in the light. And I just love how that makes me think about how, you know, in the absence of thinking we're light, right? Like, is that Am I interpreting it correctly? Like there's, there's, we're just light and then we think and then, and it's a, it's, it's a, it's a gap in the light, right? Um, so I love that. And then Sasha, you, in your, in the first poem that you read, The Canoe My Grandmother Gave Me, you say, uh, it, you talk about how the moment of the trauma, it was all underwater, sever head from heart. And the, that that his, the historical trauma and the personal traumas that we survive that's what it does it just severs that connection you know like I don't have to feel this and the you know maybe not even think about it and and how contrary that is to that concept that in I don't know if it's in um the shoot seed or in in your tribal language Iona but the concept of ait hutchening. I know that the Canadian tribes call it like ait swallowing, um, the connection 
between head and heart being good feelings or like in resonance with, with everything around you. Um, and then just kind of like how the language that we have that in the language and there's all these other things in the language that do that. They connect the head to the heart to everything else around us, right? And so that's like where the value is and um, to be able to connect that in poetry and in writing is just so beautiful too. Um, I've enjoyed hearing how that has been, you know, how that shows up in your work. Um, do you, uh, when, when you are writing, um, do you feel like, there's the thing that you, that you want to write, but then do you ever feel like there's the thing, you, you mentioned the ancestors that are behind you, and then also um, your line, Sasha, um, I'm tired of writing about old things. <laughs> And then, and then you finish the poem and you say, I'm in, oh, you say, because I will never be done writing about old things. Do, do you ever feel like this pressure from, you know, either your just outside or your own consciousness to, to write about old things and wish that you could just like, you know, kind of talk about that a little bit. I mean, obviously you do because it's in your poem, but yeah, I want to, yeah. I want to hear both of you kind of talk through how you kind of work with that. This is actually a very exciting question for me. So thank you. Um, that specifically because of my experience with that poem, like uh, the Redwoods um, is a perfect example of what you're talking about. Where it's like, I, the pressure or the way um, it just sort of steers you into something. So I thought about this poem, uh, the Redwoods in kind of like a, a it's, for lack of a better way to say it, like kind of bratty. Like I, I've been in conversation with some other, um, uh, my dear friends, like indigenous artists, uh, a filmmaker, uh, a, a jewelry maker. And we're kind of talking about how we're always expected to, to write about these certain things, right? In like a, the white literary world, it's like, yeah, but can you talk more about salmon and your grandma? And I was kind of like, no, <laughs> we'll talk about all kinds of, you know? So when I was like, on on um I was on like an eight day um solo drive up the coast I had uh just left my partner in California and me and my dog drove up the coast and camped every night and it was really a beautiful experience but I went into it with this like I'm not gonna write a nature poem I'm not gonna <laughs> write like the the native poem I'm gonna write about just like camping and being on my own and every night I would set up camp I'd build a fire and I'd take out my journal and I'd start writing. And so it started as this kind of defiant poem about like, well, I don't have to fit into this mold. But then as the nights went on and I kept writing and the, the further north I got, you know, it started about, oh, I miss my partner. What am I gonna do? But then the further north I got, it sort of like, it just became this other thing. And I was like, oh, the poem won, you know? Like I felt like my grandmother's presence. I felt like that like ancestral guidance. And I was like, even when I wanna be like this, like I'm gonna write about punk and like other stuff. And then at the end of the, it was so funny to see it transform like that. And uh, I finished it like in um, Astoria um, where uh, a, a place I, I visit often, one of my ancestors, um, I've done a lot of research there about her and her life. And I was camping and I ended up adding a whole nother night. I was like, I know I'm only like four hours away from home, but I'm going to go ahead and add another night. And I finished that poem and just kind of felt, oh, this is, it, this is what it was supposed to be. So there was that pressure of like, and, and I don't know if pressure is the right word. It was more of like guidance where I was like, I'm not going to talk about this. And it was like, oh no, you still need. And so when it comes to that ending line, I will never be done writing about old things. I literally had this experience of learning something about myself and being like, that's okay. You can keep doing that. So that is my long rambly answer to your question. That's perfect. <laughs> Thank you. And how about you, Ayana, when you say that you feel um, when your ancestors are with you in the writing, um, the, how, interacting with um, sort of where you think the writing is going versus 
where it ends up taking you. <laughs> Talk about that a little bit. We, we have a, a, a whakatauki or a, a, a proverb, which loosely translated means, you know, you face into the future or you look towards the future or you head towards the future while looking to the past. So it's that notion of our, our pasts are always with us. Eh? Um, and here and now, for me, I only have this moment, you know, but I, I am fully informed by what's happened before. Um, <laughs> this is a funny question, but it's not funny. I'm always cautious about how I answer because, you know, I might come across as being a bit flaky. Um, for me, my writing process is, I think I said before, really intuitive. And sometimes for me, being in nature all the time is awesome. And that's when I feel most connected to everything. Um, and sometimes when I go for a walk, I'll get a download of a poem. So I'll write it down on my phone or if, I'm, if I've got a notebook with me, I'll write it down. Um, and sometimes they come fully formed and I don't think that's necessarily my voice, if that makes sense. I think that's all of those people before me saying, hey, we've got this stuff that we need you to say. Um, it's quite a lot of people in Aotearoa who are, are writing about um, indigeneity and historical stuff um, and I know that I've written a lot about historical stuff in all of my all of my writing um, and I don't think we're ever done talking about it you know because whether whether we have children or not there are other generations that will come that, that need to know this stuff yeah and it, even in New Zealand we're only just looking to change the school curriculum where we teach the actual history of what happened to indigenous people here. Um, taken a bloody long time, excuse my language, but you know, it's, it's really frustrating. Um, and I don't wanna be one of those people who stand up and, and says rah, rah, rah. I think I've found a way, I've found my voice, I think in terms of how I write and it is very much informed by the past and it is very much informed by what comes through me sometimes I, I think I just see myself as a bit of a conduit really yeah hope I that didn't that. sound too flaky <laughs> no not at all it sounded it rang true to me yeah real true um I think of this, well, this, there was this poet, Ruth Stone, she said that um, sometimes she'll be out living her life and the, the, the poem will come and she'll try to grab it by the tail and write it, you know, like she, she the way she visualized it as these things that are like flying across the landscape and you get one, sometimes you catch one. I think that's cool. Kind of sounded like a little bit of what you were talking about, but, and then also, um, oh gosh, is it William Burroughs? I read The Adding Machine and he talks about how every voice that has ever been, like all the words and sounds that have ever been made are still kind of bouncing around the atmosphere. They have no way to leave. And so it's mm -hmm. all just up there. And I was like, wow. So, you know, sometimes they bounce back and, and we can have one of the, maybe that's where poems come from. <laughs> Who knows? It's just- I like that idea. I like that idea. <laughs> yeah. Yep. And then if we are, if you're in your homelands, you can be the conduit for those voices. Hmm. Yeah. And also in our DNA, right? It's there still encoded in us. Yeah. Super fascinating. Um, yeah. You, you look like you have something, Sasha. Oh, no, I'm just like enjoying uh, this conversation and um, yeah, thinking about the way things are encoded in us and I'm just like sitting here riffing on like, oh yeah, yeah, definitely. Like just to go back to what it was like to be away from like Coast Salish lands for several months when I was like kind of hanging out with a partner down in um, California and how I feel like things kind of went quiet a little bit in this weird way, like not writer's block, but I was just like, huh. And like, I loved it down there. It's beautiful. It's sunny. It's what it's California. But uh, when like the further north I got and then the, those things like the, the poems, how they just kind of appear like that got louder. And I was like, oh, like I'm just basically just nodding and agreeing with you and being like, yep, yep. 
that's real. <laughs> cool. Um, so talking about the hard stuff, like writing about the hard stuff, um, do you feel like that is an act of healing? Um, do you, yeah, I, I suppose just that, is it something that, you know, you feel like you're just kind of exercising the, the feelings out onto the page? Um, or is it like a dialogue with yourself to kind of, you know, see what you're thinking? This is when I write hard stuff, I write it and I see and I think, huh, okay. And then, you know, I can respond to it in a, in a, in a way that feels more um, whole, I suppose. Yeah. I think that um, to answer your question, like when you're writing about the hard stuff, which is something I always do, I feel like um, I warn my like friends and loved ones when they come to my, like my dad still won't come to my readings and I don't like um, blame him for that. It's too hard for him. Like I, I feel like I always have a disclaimer, like this is a harsh toke, like for lack mm -hmm. of a better, this is going to be a bummer. I don't know. <laughs> um, so I'm often um, sort of deep diving into these hard, hard topics, hard memories. Um, and I think that it absolutely can be an act of healing. But um, as someone who, you know, just recently within the, the past few years, uh, experienced, like I, I mentioned that manuscript I wrote in my MFA program, where I was like, I'm going to write this story because I, I, I had every intention that it would be healing. But in the act of doing it, it wasn't. So I think that it can be when like, I, I just had to stop and listen and be like, listen to, you know, my, like, that, that ancestral knowledge and like, um, the first go through, like my first uh, draft of that memoir, um, really, really unearthed some things. And I, I wasn't prepared for that. So whether it, whether you're writing poetry or memoir or hybrid, I love hybrid and lyric essay and flash fiction. I love that you even brought that up. I'm like, I love tiny stories. Whatever you're doing, if you're bringing up and like um, exploring your own like pain and trauma, like if you're not prepared for it, which I super wasn't, it wasn't healing. It was so destructive. It was the opposite of healing. And I was young and still in my grad program and didn't realize what I had just done to myself, excavating some of those memories. And I was like, that 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 was a, a, a train wreck, right? Um, but, you know, a, a year later when I started on the poems in Rose Quartz and I started on Red Paint, that's when the healing happened. So I think that it can be, and it is like so, so healing, but I guess, with the right I don't know I don't I don't know how to say I know that. what you're saying okay. yeah I totally get it. I I had a residency once where I was going to write a memoir and I I would start and then it, it was like this is what am I doing and then I started like really kind of hating the whole process of writing all together <laughs> you know because when you're at a residency and you're like alone with your words and your thoughts and this project and it's so daunting and then so I'd be like, whatever, I'm going to write these poems. And my whole second collection kind of came out of like avoiding writing about the hard stuff because you can like really wound yourself. And I feel like the expectation that, you know, the, the feeling like, well, you know, we have these obligations to tell our stories and things like that. It's like, well, you know, yeah, okay. But in our own time, right? Like in my own time and let's just not do you do that to mm -hmm. <laughs> writers um, about what they should be writing? Like I read your interview about the um, the mentioning the woman who wanted more details about, you know, mm -hmm. a, a particularly traumatic event. And you're just like, can we just let that live <laughs> in like the, in the shadows? Like, you know, <gasps> yeah. And then it's powerful too. I read something recently. Um, I've, I've been thinking about trying to write horror and the, Guy's essay, um, Benjamin Percy, he says that a lot of the good, the, the masters of horror will let the really awful thing like happen off camera so that it lives in the imagination of the, uh, the reader um, because then the, it can be just like way more, <laughs> you know, what it is, I guess. Um, Flannery O'Connor, he uses her as an example for like all of the terrible violence happens sort of off camera, but you know it's happening. Um, so 
yeah craft, craft wise that can be a thing too right not saying it yeah and I think that's such an important thing to um like I I felt really um not prepared for that kind of feedback and I had it through different professors um folks who were like different editors people who were reading the work and I wasn't prepared for them to be like uh you go into this weird dreamlike state in this moment of a hard memory of a very traumatic event. Why are you talking about whales now? And I was like, why wouldn't I be talking about whales? <laughs> what? And they were like, can you, can you um, spell it out more concretely? We need to see it. And I was just like, what is wrong with you? Like, <laughs> no. And like, I, now I, I feel a bit more like, you know, I have wiser now, but it, I, I, and I tried, like I took editors and um, professors advice and was like, okay, I'm going to write it out and spell it out. And that felt so um, wrong for the writing process when you're dealing with such delicate stuff. And I think that, um, that, that line that you brought up earlier in my poetry, like about um, dunking my head beneath water, um, like severing head from heart, is also like me sort of addressing disassociation and what can happen to us in our in our most like fight or flight survival modes and I'm angry at like not angry but you know I'm kind of like those professors and those mentors who were telling me to spell it out more I'm like you should not have been telling me to do that like I think that there's an important um process about writing about these things and not going into gratuitous detail yeah totally I think that sort of raises the um, this voyeuristic kind of quality often of an audience, eh? You know, um, they want to know more because it's to feed them, right? It's not, yeah, and I think writing that I read, and, and maybe maybe this is what I try to do too, is like leave some of it up to the reader because my experience is going to be different to somebody else's and I don't have to spell it out. Um, I, I too have had other people want me to give more detail, you know, it's like, what planet are you on? Like, seriously, <laughs> it's really clear. I don't need to tell you anymore. Yeah. 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 That voyeur voyeuristic, that is the, that hits it right on the head in my experience. That's how it feels to me when, because uh, I've been asked, why don't you write about, you know, and I'm like, well, <laughs> because, <laughs> and then, uh, and it does feel like uh, um, not honest in some ways, and some of the work that I'm doing right now, it feels a little bit like watered down, and I'm writing about nature, and I'm writing about grandmothers and, you know, and and the old me would have been just like oh Rena but um but now I feel also um being home again in my in my community and then in a place where I I feel like I crossed some kind of threshold of 40 or something and I don't uh, just feeling kind of nostalgia for all like you say like the things you you know that you thought would be there forever when you were a child and that now they're not and so my heart's kind of reaching out for those things in in my writing where before I felt like well those are mine I'm gonna keep those and I'm not gonna let you know that be with the audience or whatever it just it's um yeah it's such a personal thing what we choose to write about or like what comes mm -hmm. out of the writing even just beyond our own choosing, <laughs> um, mm. right? Because in some ways it's, it's like a co-creation. Um, mm. Yeah. Conversely for me, um, I think as I've, got, I've gotten older, um, not to be ageist, but certainly in terms of, I, I feel like now particularly, or perhaps in my writing, I, I kind of have a duty to, to, to name things, um, particularly around the hard stuff, because I don't know about, you know, um, I've never been to the States, you know, so I only know what my son told me from the times he toured there and other people. But 
it's certainly here in Aotearoa, New Zealand, there's a real silencing that goes on around difficult stuff. And there's a real, um, it's quite a lot of avoidance, you know, and I think, I know for myself, my next project is, it's already started, um, is, is going to be around voicing suicide because there's so much of it and it affects people. And many of us have been to that edge. Many of us have walked those lines. Many of us um, know people who have suicided. So I know uh, just through feedback, you know, often feedback, you, you get a lot of feedback. It's like, oh, that's really nice. Um, but some of the harder feedback for me has been that people have found it really useful that I've been able to put into words stuff that they can't. And, you know, that's a privilege for me to, to be able to do that. And I, I, I think as I've gotten older, but particularly since Ruben died, because he's my only child, um, yeah, I feel like I have a responsibility to the generations that are coming after me to say, I'm not shying away from this stuff. I'm not going to be quiet about this stuff because this is affecting you. What sort of a world have you guys inherited, you know? Um, so I, I'm starting to shake as I'm talking about it. So it's probably an indication that I need to do it, right? Um, yeah. It just feels really important to me to do this. Yeah. It's so important. I'm so glad that you, you know, that you are answering that. Mm. Thank you. Yeah. I, I also, I, I think that there's like oftentimes like what you're saying about silence and like almost like a, a stigma or something that exists around like not talking about that hard stuff and like mental health stuff and suicide stuff. Like even in my own experience, um, writing memoir, writing like my experiences, um, I, I, I sort of wrestled with this moment where I didn't know if I wanted to put it in the book because it was something that I had learned um, through uh, my mom telling me stories and, uh, you know, our grandmother was like the, you know, matriarch the, 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 of our family, like this, uh, always like so strong, like a tank of a woman in such a beautiful way. And my mom shared with me a story about um, a time where when she was young and, and going through a really dark period, actually, um, like wrestled with um, suicidal thoughts. And that kind of blew my mind because it was like, no, grandma was grandma like no she was the strongest woman I know but I think that for me having to unpack that process of like the strongest woman you know can still wrestle with that and that's okay and why wouldn't I share that and be honest with it but it, it just speaks to that mm -hmm. silence you're talking about that that like uh initial like oh I shouldn't say that in the book because I shouldn't like let that be known but then it was like no this stories like that do need to be shared and I I just feel like it's so important. Mm -hmm. So is there, um, as, as we kind of draw to a close today, is there anything about your work or about, um, about your writing and your process that you feel is important um, to share? Or maybe if you have a question for each other or for me, um, we can do that also. I might start this round. Yeah. Um, first off, I just want to thank you all for, for being here and being available and being willing and for the openness and the honesty. Like, I just really appreciate it. And listening to your, your kupu, your words, you know, how that resonance how that shared experience as, as wahine or woman who identify, or people who identify as female, um, just, you know, how words just, um, they, they cover time and space, yeah, and it is all around us, and I just love it when I get together with other people and we're like, yeah, you know, we're all vibing in the same way. It's beautiful. So I just want to say big kia ora and thank you so much. Um, and I think for me is just to sort of wind up my, I'm really aware that there's a lot of people who can't access a written word. And so it's become more important for me to find other ways to get my, my, my words out in the world. So I've, I'm more and more interested about doing multimedia stuff and 
I have someone who's taken the words that I spray painted on a fence. They've taken that and they're splicing it up and they're doing some kind of choir thing where sound is responding to the words. I just think that's amazing. That's and awesome. how many more people, you know, how many more people can access that? And I had a poem made into a dance recently for National Flash Fiction. Day. It was so amazing to just see how other people were responding to the work. So <laughs> I think that's something I'm really passionate about too. You know, I, I try and do podcasts as often as I can so that people who can't read the written words so well are able to listen. Um, yeah, so that's probably enough for me. <laughs> I love that. I love that. And um, I hope that you'll come to the United States and visit us sometime. <laughs> I would love to have us do a reading here in the Seattle City of Literature together. That would be amazing. <laughs> oh, yeah, be beautiful. <laughs> yeah. I absolutely agree with that. Like just being in um, this virtual space with you all today has been so beautiful and amazing. And like, uh, I, yeah, I feel like I'm going to ramble and I'm going to try not to. But um, yeah, just being in a room with folks who I feel like almost kindred spirit with, like talking about hard things, talking about where poems or these things come from. Um, sometimes it can feel kind of alienating when you're with folks that don't understand the process or like tackle the hard things. And so this is always so like, just, it feels like nourishment for me. So I would, I second that. I hope that we can all be somewhere in real life and real space together, um, I would feel so honored to like read aside, like alongside you guys. Like this has been <laughs> beautiful and I feel so, so endlessly grateful. Yeah, I echo both of what you've said uh, or all of what both of you have said. Um, yeah, it's, it's always just really nice to um, be in conversation with people whose work you resonate with and um, you know, who, who have similar life experiences and, um, yeah, and have written about them bravely and with, uh, courage and a, and a beautiful, fierce, amazing voice. So thank you both so much for your work and for, uh, sharing your words today. And it's just been amazing. It's been wonderful. Thank you all so much. This has been such an amazing conversation and it's such a pleasure to, to hear all of your beautiful words and, and get to um, be a fly on the wall while you all chat. So thank you. Thank you so much for that. And so if folks watching are interested in finding out more about Sasha, Iona, or Rena's work, uh, we're going to put links uh, to their books and their websites in the show description below. So you'll be able to find out more and, and click to buy copies. We want to thank our partners at Dunedin UNESCO City of Literature. And of course, we're grateful to the Seattle Office of Arts and Culture, the Amazon Literary Partnership, and Seattle University for their support of tonight's program. And of course, thanks to all of you for watching. And uh, we'll see you next time. Have a good night. Thank you, Stasha.